This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode, alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we chat with masters of horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now, today's guest is Sina Paleo, and I believe, Bob, that you have her bio. Yes, it is. Cynthia Paleo is a two-time Stoker Awards-nominated poet and author. She's the author of Loteria, The Missing, Poems of My Night. Her uh, recent poetry collection, Into the Forest and All the Way Through, explores crime fiction and the epidemic of missing and murdered women in the United States and was also nominated for a Bram Stoker Award and Elgin Award. Her modern-day horror retelling of the Pied Piper fairy tale, Children of Chicago, was released this year by Agora Polis Books. And that is Cynthia Paleo. All right. And as with many of these conversations, this is a two-parter. And in this, the first part, I mean, we kick off talking about life lessons growing up in inner city Chicago. And it must be one of the most powerful openings to a This Is Horror podcast we've had. I think it's right up there with the likes of John Skip. Mm Mm-hmm. I definitely agree. Uh, she, she had a tough upbringing and, uh, it's, it's, and I just believe that it's, it's really kind of shaped her, her life her her fiction. Um, uh, and it's, it's just, you get that inner city turmoil and, um, it, it definitely shapes people. Yeah. And this part is very much the personal, whereas the second part is more about writing, but. We certainly do get into some writing tips, particularly how to write about villains and how to write about flawed characters. Mm -hmm. Well, before the conversation, let's have a little bit of an advert break. Spacefaring researchers disturb an ancient horror. An enchanted object curses a grieving widow. A haunted reel torments a film student. A murder trial hinges on a chilling testimony. Howls from Hell. A new horror anthology from Hal Society Press. Stephen Graham Jones calls it quality horror by true believers who can write. With a foreword by Grady Hendrix, Howls from Hell unveils the horror writers of tomorrow with spine-tingling stories from P.L. McMillan, Shane Hawk, J.W. Donnelly, Lindsay Ragsdale, Amanda Nevada DeMell, and others. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audiobook from Amazon and most other major booksellers. Howls from Hell. Winner of the Indies Today 2020 Best Horror Award, Michael Jess Alexander's Boarded Windows Dead Leaves is a tour de force horror collection of tales meant to terrify. Alexander's writing adds a twist of wryness to the reader's smugly satisfied smile, says reader's favorite. Fire Fiction says you'll feel at home with these stories, which certainly offer an entertaining and macabre read. Pick up Boarded Windows Dead Leaves on Amazon and other retailers, also now available as an incredible audiobook experience courtesy of Spooky House Press. Okay, well, with that said, here it is. It is Cynthia Paleo on This Is Horror. Cena, welcome to This Is Horror. Thank you. Hi, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure and been a long time coming. And I thought to begin with, let's jump into things. I want to know what some of the early life lessons were that you learned growing up in inner city Chicago. Oh, wow. We're, we're, we're really, <laughs> we're really starting. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, um, so I was born in Puerto Rico. Um, and well, my parents kind of went back and forth between the mainland and Puerto Rico. Um, my, both my brothers were born 
on the mainland. So they were born in Chicago. And then my mother um, had some difficulty after her mother died. And so she, they went back to Puerto Rico and I, that's where they had me. And I was only there up until I was two. And then we moved to um, Chicago. We moved, they, my parents moved back to Chicago. They didn't move to the original neighborhood that they were in. So they moved into a neighborhood that was like, um, it was a really um, uh, mixed. So it was like German, Polish, Hispanic. Um, but we were, I think, I believe on our block, we were the first Hispanic family. Um, and within like 10 years, like, um, you know, that we, it, it, was, it turned into like, you know, 90% um, Hispanic neighborhood, mostly. Um, Puerto Rican, Mexican, my husband's Mexican, and his family has a very similar story where they came here, I believe his family came here in the early 80s, but um, yeah, it was um, it was a strange upbringing. Uh, my parents grew up in the 40s in rural Puerto Rico, and so I think a, a lot of it was a shock for them, like how do we raise children when they really didn't have the most loving upbringing themselves and then to bring them into a completely different type of environment so i i wasn't um i grew up speaking english um they forced my parents forced that on me i didn't learn spanish um and more formal spanish into high school because my parents were very worried about us being discriminated. That was a constant worry of my father. And my father had gone through quite a bit. Like he used to get kicked out of um, restaurants because they would hear his accent. Um, he had been called names, he had been attacked. And my father was very like protective. He didn't want me to experience any racism. Um, and <laughs> I remember the very first time I experienced it, it was a, a shock when I left um, my neighborhood. But you know, we, we grew up in a very, um, I think at the time it was, it was pretty, it was still, um, a poor community. Um, gangs were certainly part of the environment. Um, crime was a part of the environment. Um, I have friends that were, or classmates that were killed in, uh, gang and gang crime. Um, we, it was, it, it, it is the city, and so I think anything that you can imagine that that would entail, um, I had been exposed to. I had seen, you know, twelve-year-old classmates um, be pregnant, um, which, you know, that was very confusing at that time. I have seen, you know, fights in the halls, <laughs> in high school break out when there's like blood on the floor, and um, it was an environment where I had to find my place and be safe and my place was um you know with a very, very small group of people that we you know we were very protective of one another my parents were super super protective my high school was probably like two blocks down and my dad would drive me to the front door everybody in the high school knew who my father was because my parents were just terrified that something would happen to us, and um, I had a really good support system, but uh, I think a lot of that trauma is still with me. Um, you know, we're still, I still live in the same neighborhood that I grew up in, and the neighborhood's changed. I mean, lots of parts of Chicago have changed because of gentrification, and I feel like at least for me, it was important to stay in the neighborhood that I grew up in, or at least in the area that I grew up in, to be a mentor to youth, to say that I know these are the struggles. I know that there's frustrations of poverty. I know there's there's the fear of gang and gun crime, but you can make a choice to select a certain path. I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. Um, I remember getting my master's degree and, um, you know, the dean of our school said, if you're one of the first people getting this degree today, stand up. And I, it didn't dawn on me at that point. I remember standing up and my father just completely crying because we didn't think that was a possibility. We, we thought, at least for me, I didn't think I would live past 21 just because of the environment that I grew up in. Um, 
And I think a lot of that seeps into my writing. Um, I wanted to be a journalist. I had like these romantic visions of being like this, you know, community reporter. And, um, and I did. I worked as a community reporter for a little bit. But seeing crime face on again after finishing college, I, I couldn't take it anymore. And I feel like I had like a bit of a mental break after I arrived on a scene where there was this young man and everybody in the neighborhood knew him. Like he had just gotten out of jail. He had a girlfriend. He was young. He was probably like 18, 19. He was trying to get, you know, things together. And there was like five bullet holes in his back. And the police were on one side screaming at me. And the community was on another side screaming at me, telling me the police shot and killed this young man. And I called my editor and I was like, I can't, I'm not going to write it because I'm going to tell you what I see. And I see that this young man was murdered. So that's the story and I'm done. And um, that was my the end of my journalism career because I just, I couldn't speak objectively at that point. I had seen what I couldn't deny and I still wanted to keep writing. I just didn't think I could do journalism anymore. And so, like my dream was always to go to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And I was like, well, I can never, someone like me can never go there, that fancy place. And I applied and I got, uh, I got rejected. <laughs> and um, the chair of the program called me at work and he's like, can you get in a cab back then? This is before Uber. Um, he's like, can you get in a cab and come down here and talk, talk to me? Because I want to understand what it is you want to do. Um, because your portfolio shows journalism and you're telling me you want to be a fiction writer um, or you're telling me you want to just want to write creative fiction. Like, what does that mean? And I went and I spoke with him and I told him, I want to write. I don't know what I want to say, but I cannot not write. And so I got accepted after it was like petitioned to the, to the board that like, well, she can write, let her explore and at the time the school there institute didn't have i don't know what it's like now but genre was not something it was something that they looked down on at that time and so they didn't know what to do with me they were like well she's a journalist she wants to explore this inner city experience that she lives with what do we do with her and so they teamed me up with um, my graduate advisors became uh, were the two playwrights in the program um, because they thought, well, let's explore emotion, let's explore dialogue. And throughout in that in that experience, I um, discovered a lot of um, mystery and crime writing and that just felt like it clicked and I started being able to put connections together. And I think ultimately what I've been wanting to do is tell people what I've seen, tell people that I am, I am not supposed to be here. I, I do not, be, I, I believe that I'm here on some luck or fluke or some, you know, the universe kind of like, I don't know how I wound up surviving that experience growing up. And, you know, maybe it was, um, you know, my my parents who were just viciously protective and to the point where it was almost abusive and scary. I, I couldn't leave my bedroom. Like, that's scary as a child. Like, I can't leave my bedroom. I can't go sit on a porch. I can't talk to friends because they were just so scared that I would get mixed up in something that I couldn't get out of. And all I had in my bedroom was like a little TV and a little VCR and you know movies and i watched a lot of monster movies and it was that connection of being stuck in my house because i couldn't go outside because there were gangs outside and then also living that experience when i went to school i mean like my freshman year in high school i think what was it we started with 800 900 kids my freshman year and only like 200 of us graduated senior year we lost a lot of kids and it was losing them because they were kicked out they were pushed out being pushed out was definitely a thing a lot of these children were pushed out um you know gang violence was an issue but these were really great kids that needed support and i realized that the reason i 
was able to explore writing. I was able to go to colleges because I had mentors. I had people that believed in me enough to say, hey, you're going to be somebody. And a lot of these kids didn't. And that's part of why it was important for me to stay here. It's important for me to be a presence in this neighborhood, to be a mentor, because these are some of the most brilliant people I've ever worked with. And, you know, we have we have grit, <laughs> people from the inner city. Like, you know, we we get knocked, we get like our entire identity and experience is getting knocked down and people telling us no and people telling us we're not good enough and we don't belong. And then we just get back up because we have no choice. We don't have anything. <laughs> I grew up with nothing. I started working when I was 14 and I started working because my parents couldn't afford to buy deodorant for me. Like that's how tough it was. I couldn't get deodorant so I had to work weekends I started working full-time at 17 and I'm 41 so I've been working full-time and one job or another since I was 17 I've always worked because I it was the I mean it was embedded in me that you you need we can my parents were always like we can't help you we can give you a roof over your head but we don't have any money to give you anything else so um that's a very long way of saying this is how I've gotten here <laughs> and this is how, oh, how I'm still here. But, um, you know, I've worked hard um, and writing has been a way to, writing and monsters have been a way for me to kind of work through what I have lived through and the people that I've lost and the people that I knew deserved better but couldn't get better. And I feel like I want to make them proud. I want to, people to be proud of people in the city um, and to show that there is beauty here, even though there's a lot of scary things here as well. My goodness, that, <laughs> wow. I don't even know mm -hmm. where to go from there. Thank you so much for sharing everything with us. I think I mean, I feel like I've been on a journey just listening to to everything there. And I mean, there's so many directions that we could now take this. But I wonder, as someone who from an early age didn't think you would live past 21, I mean, how did that inform your actions and choices that you made, both the good and the bad? Um. I mean, I look back and I see a lot of situations where I was like, wow, if my child was in that situation, I would just like pass out because I did some dumb stuff. <laughs> I did some really scary things, um, was around a lot of bad situations I probably shouldn't have been. And I have no idea. I have no idea. And that's, um, I have no idea how I've come up on the other side and I'm physically <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't like there was always threats. I mean, I've had. I remember. I remember one time. I have clear memory. My brother, like, burst into my classroom one day, and he was like, "We have." And, and the teacher was like, "What's going?" On? And she just was like freaked out. And my brother's like, "I need to take her because she's gonna get jumped and she's probably gonna get killed." Um, because there was like eight girls that were planning to like jump me after high school. And that wasn't like a good thing. And I think a lot of that was, I mean, I was the weird, you know, I was the weird kid in high school. And at that time, people in my neighborhood didn't have green hair and listen to like Nine Inch Nails or like Kurt Cobain. And so I just, people didn't understand me and they thought I was very strange um and maybe that was scary to some people and so i used to i used to get beat up a lot in high school i you know i, I remember getting my glasses like punched right off of me in the hallway um by somebody and i don't even know why um and so it was scary it was it was scary to, it's scary to be different it was scary to be the weird kid um especially in this neighborhood back then in the, you know, in the nineties where, um, I didn't really have, uh, many places to turn to. I, I would just go home and cry and watch my monster movies and 
that was my comfort, like to see horror. Like that was the only place I could turn because I couldn't get out. And, you know, working, um, maybe that's why I worked so hard. And I've always worked and worked full time, gone to school full time, because that was like a distraction too. Like, well, if I work, I don't have to worry that, you know, I'm dirt poor and I can't afford, you know, socks or something. Like, And I could work for this. You know, I remember, I remember even in college, like sleeping in my car in between classes. And um, there was like this little deli and like the owners knew, like I was completely broke. Um, and like for, I would just give him a dollar and he would just like give me like a grilled cheese sandwich and tea and French fries and whatever, because he knew that I was sleeping in my car. It's like freezing outside. I had like 20 minutes be between my next class and then I'd have to go and, you know, work a double shift at a restaurant. So I think I got a lot of that from my dad. I, you know, I remember I remember my very first day going to college, um, and this is the first time I, you know, my first time ever being in a classroom with white people, because up until then, um, you know, most of my classmates were always um, Hispanic or or black, and so my first time in a classroom with white people, somebody called me a speck. You know, it was a derogatory, and it was just like, I didn't even know how to process that. Like I remember coming home. And telling my dad, I'm, I'm dropping out. And he told me, well, why? And I told him, well, somebody called me this name. And my dad's like, it, they're going to call you everything. Get ready. Because you're the only Puerto Rican girl in class. You think, you think this is going to end today? He's like, you can stay home. You can stay home and go work in the factory with your mom. Or, you know, you know stay at your, the job that you're at. And, but this isn't going to end today. Like, I'm, I'm sorry that this is the first time you're experiencing this, but it's not going to go away. And um, I don't know. I, you know, I went through my four years of college, always being like the only Puerto Rican girl in class. I didn't make any friends in undergrad because um, I would go to class and leave. And, you know, I've, I had teachers, you know, call me <laughs> derogatory names, too. And I feel like things are better today because there is a community online like people can connect with other people and back when I was going to school there really wasn't like online communities that I can turn to and connect with people um also part of part of that was um my, my now husband like I, I've known him since we were like 13 14 years old um and we were friends for a long time and I feel like part of our relationship has been supporting one another through these things that you know his parents too were, were factory workers like his father his father crawled through the sewer system from mexico to get to the u.s and like he was deported like i think five times and he just persistently kept coming um because he wanted to reunite with his his, his uh, wife who was he who had come here first and so between his experience with his family and my parents coming here to live on the mainland from Puerto Rico and living in factories and, or I'm sorry, working in factories. I guess I had no choice. It was either work hard or, I mean, sink. Like there was, there was no, I had no choice. It was, it, it, there was no choice. Um, and it's, it hasn't been easy. I mean, I, I, even like with actual writing, I think sometimes people don't understand what it is I'm trying to communicate or they might look, look at it on the surface level and say, well, she's writing about a villain. So that means she probably sides with that type of individual or, or experience. But a lot of what I have written recently, I, you know, I, um, like with Children of Chicago, was ex I wanted to kind of explore someone that is a villain. I wanted to explore somebody that had, I felt like I had gone through so much trauma growing up that I could have chosen to be completely wicked and completely hateful, but I chose something different. I chose to love myself and I chose to look outside and look up at the sky and realize how I'm alive. My other friends aren't so lucky. I have, you know, friends serving life for murder. Um, one young man that I know, you know, he was playing 
football in college and he came home to visit and he was killed. And so it's like, they don't have like what I literally have right now, looking up at the sky. And so what can I do? Um, and so I chose love, but with Children of Chicago, I wanted to explore what about someone that has gone through all this trauma and all this hate and they just choose to just stay wicked and evil. Um, what does that mean? Because we have a lot of bad people out here. Um, I mean, I've almost gotten carjacked like twice. The last time I almost got carjacked was last year and my children were in the car. Like I'm standing there, my parents are in the alley and somebody walked up to me ready to carjack me and you know, my kids were in the car. So it's like, there's some really awful and wicked people out there, but I, I want to choose every day to be positive and it's work. It's work to wake up and write. It's work to acknowledge that the bad things that happen to me are not me. To acknowledge that I can choose a different reality for myself. To acknowledge that my parents went through probably <laughs> a really difficult upbringing. Um, they didn't know how to show me love because of that. And so I'm going to choose a different way to show my children. So I think it's it's just constant work. I wake up every day and it's work to stay positive. It's work to work. It's work to choose something better for myself. Yeah. And I mean, on the matter of writing about villains and writing about the awful things that happen in this world, I mean, I know you've said before there can be a misconception sometimes from people that almost, I guess, put the the artist and the art together. And so, you know, we need to show people that, of course, like just because we're writing about these terrible things, it does not mean we are these terrible things or we endorse those. So, I mean, I wondered if you could speak a little bit about that. Oh, sure. I mean, it's... I think if there's anyone that can hold a mirror up to society and tell society like this is what is wrong with you, <laughs> it's the artist and it's a very vulnerable position to be in because you're always, you're always going to be prone to criticism. You're always going to be prone to or open to it, right? You're always going to be open to this harsh critique of what you should have said and how you should have said it. I mean, granted, I do, I, I do think the artist also holds responsibility for the potential of causing and creating harm. Um, so that's, that's a given, but I think that, especially as writers of dark fiction of, of horror, mystery, crime, I think we're in a really, interesting position that we can explore characters um and works you know that have you know uh hannibal lecter i mean every major like villain that up until you know that i feel like the <laughs> the dark fiction and the horror community is fascinated with that was created by somebody that person the per you know wes craven was not um you know, Kruger from the last house of the, on the left, you know, Wes Craven w is not, you know, Freddy Krueger, you know, he created this very wicked person, um, entity for Nightmare on Elm Street. And then he also in turn, you know, his first work was, you know, creating that last house on the left work, which is very gruesome. Um, but it explored the viciousness of some people. And is it painful? Yes. But I think, at least for me, that's something that I've been very interested in exploring, villains. Um, especially the female villain, where I feel like we haven't seen a lot of the female villain in art. And, um, and like, why is that? I feel like women can be really cruel. Um, you know, I, I've, some of the, some of the harshest, you know, attacks I've ever experienced are from, you know, my mother, for example, you know, other women. And so I've been, always been very fascinated to explore um, the female villain and just 
what does that mean? Um, why can't we explore it? Or why is it that every time, uh, or why is it very often when a female villain, villain is explored, there's very, very harsh criticisms about that. And I think it's a lot about, it's, I think it's still a lot of ingrained misogyny that we still expect women, you know, people might be upset when I say this, but um, you know, you know, we still really love the, you know, the the figure of the final girl. This is a woman that awful things happens to her, happen to her, or happens to her throughout the course of the narrative or the film, and she defeats the monster and she comes through at the end of, at you know, at the end, victorious. What if we flip that? What if we make a woman that is completely in her own power, that is completely okay with being a monster? and owns it and doesn't care. That's really terrifying, I think, for a lot of people to even think of. And so at least with, um, in Children of Chicago, uh, you know, the protagonist is a villain. She's a Latina, um, she's an officer. And that was definitely, um, that is definitely a very difficult story to read because of all that we're experiencing with law enforcement in the US. And it's like a constant issue that we've, we've dealt with, but um, that was a very hard story to write because children should look to the adult to protect them and to trust. But I wrote a story where the person that the children were supposed to trust could not be trusted. At least for me and growing up, that was very often the case where the person that was the adult a person that was the person of a, uh, in a position of authority that I should have trusted turned out to be the bad person. Um, and so, I mean, it's not a happy ending. Uh, not everything that I write is a happy ending. And I feel like in horror and dark fiction and crime, I mean, it's, it's not always going to be a happy ending. There's awful people out there. Um, you know, my poetry collection Into the Forest and All the Way Through is a collection of 109 poems of missing and murdered women that there is no happy ending there and so what does that mean like we have to stop and look at these awful things that are happening I can't answer the questions I can only tell you as an artist what it is I see and I do see at least from my upbringing I have seen a lot of cruelty um I haven't to date allowed it to break me um but I've seen a lot of it and I think that it's scary to sit back and see the monsters out there. And we are the monsters. Um, people are the monsters. I mean, I, I've never really, I, at least today, I don't really gravitate to like creature feature and horror. I'm fascinated with humans as monsters because we do some awful things to each other. And it's so sad. Yeah, and I'm wondering, when did you first realized that you couldn't trust or rely on those very people that you're meant to be able to trust and rely on? Oh, I mean, it was like constant throughout. I mean, gosh, um, I, very young, <laughs> very young, um, in school, especially, um, teachers uh, telling me things about my culture, teachers making fun of the way my dad spoke um, English, um, you know, people telling me that I didn't belong in this country, people telling me that I wasn't American because I'm Puerto Rican. Um, you know, I've had, oh gosh, I've had, I've had more than enough run-ins with the police myself. Um, you know, I've, Gosh, I cut school because, you know, I'm, I was like, what? I was a kid. So I, I, you know, skipped class and, you know, was with some of my friends. And, you know, as opposed to the police just asking us, like, go back to school. What are you doing? You know, I got my, my arm like twisted behind me and then slammed up against, you know, the squad car. Um, and that happened a few times where, you know, the police really roughed me up because I, wasn't in school or was with people that they didn't think I should be with. Um, I mean, I've gotten pulled over by the police, like outside of my garage, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, with the guns drawn and it's like, what the hell? Um, 
am I doing? I'm coming, I'm going home. Um, so yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've seen some stuff. I've been through some stuff. Um, college undergrad was a huge struggle because it was constantly having to prove that I belonged in college, um, at a time where there wasn't a lot of Hispanics in my college. And, you know, um, and my MFA program, oh gosh, that was a whole other experience where, you know, I, it was, um, I was the only Latina in the program at that point. And it was constantly trying to prove myself that, trying to prove to them that I belong there. And I felt like, uh, to those people and to some of those people, it didn't matter to them. I never belong and I never will belong. And so I think a lot of it has been coming to terms with, um, I'm not going to be accepted by a lot of people. And I mean, that's okay. Uh, I have to kind of get over this idea that I have to be, I have to prove myself to people. I think I've, 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 I've always been in this position where I'm trying to prove myself to people in positions of power, people in positions of authority to say, look, I am smart enough and I am good enough and I am not what you think I am. And I mean, I, I think I'm just exhausted of it now. And it's like, if I haven't proven to people by now um, my worth, then it's not worth proving to them. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, what can we do for the other people who are in a similar situation? Those who feel that they're not supposed to be here or those who feel like they don't belong? What kind of things can we do to teach them that they are supposed to be here? And, you know, how can we support them? How can we look at reversing that narrative i think things are gosh i i i'm so i'm so happy with um the diversity that i'm seeing in art it's just it makes me really emotional because i was you know i started writing i started writing like uh, with journalism like gosh like to early 2000s like 2000 <laughs> um i started writing like fiction in 2008 and I, I remember querying agents, you know, back then. And, you know, th their responses were literally like, Hispanics don't read. This is this is what I was getting told from agents. In, in 2008? 2008, yes, 2008. Um, it was like they were really bold with the things that they would say. Um, and then the constant, I can't connect with your voice. But it's like, you know, I'm a, I'm a Puerto Rican woman from the west side of Chicago. You probably don't get my voice. <laughs> and, you know, especially when, you know, at that time, the premier person writing horror, Stephen King, was like, you know, a white male from like Maine. You know, mm. we need to explore other voices. And so it was a really lonely time um, back then when I was writing, trying to explore my voice and trying to explore stories. And while the internet and social media can be hell, it also could be like this really great and supportive and beautiful place because we have a great community of diverse writers that are doing amazing things that are finally getting published and hitting the New York Times bestseller list. We have S.A. Cosby, we have Stephen Graham Jones, Sylvia Moreno Garcia. It's just, I. I am just so happy to see this. Um, I think there's a lot more um, openness and understanding that these are stories that have never been told before. And that doesn't mean that they're wrong. And I think people just need to be open that there are great stories from uh, the LGBTQ community that have never been told, that are finally being told. And I'm so excited. To, to read those. There are great stories from the Native American community that are finally being told and, 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 and supported. And so I know that, you know, um, traditional publishing has been a piece of work. <laughs> it's been, a, you know, a constant struggle to get recognition there. But there, there, there are movements that are being made. There's changes that are being made. And, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, some great, writers moving into being traditionally published. Um, and then just the indie 
horror community as well, that's been a really great space for experimentation and for new voices to be heard um, and to grow and just explode because there's just some amazing talent there. So I think a lot of it is being open to these are voices you've never heard or read before because there were gatekeepers and the indie <laughs> community has been more has been really receptive to them and traditional publishing is now being very receptive to them so i think um listening to what they have to say and why they have to say it um yeah so i think i think we're i think we're we're getting to a really good place where diversity is um really being celebrated right now and it, it makes me so happy and thankful and I, I just wish I wish I had that <laughs> way back when it makes me a little sad that I was kind of alone um, I, I stopped writing for a long time uh, for a few reasons but in part it's because I felt like I was just um, talking to a wall and there was no one listening so um, I left writing for a long time and I just came back to writing in, in what 20 19 i think after taking like a few years off three four years off yeah it's good to see that the, it's like the barriers are being broken there's still a ton of work to be done and i, I think that a, a lot of what we see with traditional publishing the the changes that are happening are happening because readers don't really they don't really care about where it comes from they just want a good story and and they i think traditional publishers are, are finally coming around and seeing the power that the indie publishing whether you're small press or self-published can actually do you know what 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 good it can do and the, the you know the strength and the, the sales and the marketing that it can do and the stories that it can tell and how diverse it is and I feel like that they're they're finally coming around. Like I said, there's a there's a ton of work to be done. Uh, I mean, for every for every it's like for every one step forward, there's you know that's it, you know traditional publishing will do something dumb and take a step back, you know. And so, but I think we're if we we can get I feel like if we get the right people on place mm -hmm. and remove the the gatekeepers right. and have new gatekeepers who want to keep the gate open then i think that things are going to be a lot better a lot of work to be done yeah i think we're we're, we're there's definitely been um great movement um in the last few years and it, it really makes me happy um to see support especially some of these newer writers are getting and it's it's been it's part of my um my you know goal to be a mentor too because when i started writing i had nobody um and so i i tried to mentor i mentor with the horror writers association i mentor with um pitch wars um you know i try to you know people you know people know that if they email me <laughs> um you know i've been you know pretty open to helping out new writers and giving them feedback on things i mean i'm not you know, I, I don't know everything. I don't know all the answers, but um, if I can be supportive in any way and help someone, then, I mean, that's that's great. I don't want anybody to feel, this is a really tough industry. This is really brutal um, for a number of reasons. You know, writing is isolating. If you have a young family, I have young children, you're away from them. If you have a day job, I have a day job. Um, you know, it. You're. If you have a day job, you're working two jobs because you're working during the day doing one thing, and then you have to switch gears at night or on the weekends and do something else. And so sometimes it feels like, you know, what is, what am I doing? Like, and it's lonely and it's frustrating. And I, I try to tell people it's, it's not a race. Um, you know, think about what it is that you need to create and tell. I mean, of course there's people, of course there's writers that this is this is their day job, this is their career, this is how they pay their mortgage. Um, and they have to, you know, meet certain deadlines and certain, you know, 
hit certain benchmarks and milestones, but um, there's some of us that have some flexibility um, because we have other careers. So, you know, I ask people, what is it that you want to do? What is the ultimate goal? Do you want to tell a good story? Do you want to make this a career? If so, you know, let's, you have to, there's a lot to think about when you want to go full-time writing. I, I know I'm not, um, I'm, I love my day job. I've been working in my day job for um, almost 20 years. It's, it's, it's a career. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I have two master's degrees. My first master's is in marketing and that's what I do by day. I'm a researcher. So I'm, I don't have the pressure that I feel like I have to, um, make this a day career. Um, I don't know, maybe that'll change. I like, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how things will I always have, I'm always, I'm always open to opportunity. Um, but as of now, I, I really, I, I adore what I do by day and knowing that I have that is freeing because then I know I can create whatever I want to create <laughs> and hopefully people will, will read it. So. And I mean, so much is you choosing to love yourself, to work your ass off and, you know, to, thrive and do your best in spite of the odds, in spite of the obstacles. And I mean, you spoke about mentoring and supporting others, but I wonder, I mean, who's your support network and what are you doing when you need someone to lean on? Um, wow. Well, um, when I was younger, I had uh, a few mentors. Um, my main mentor passed away uh, a long time ago, and that was like losing a father. Um, but I am really lucky and really thankful that um, my husband is my best friend. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I have no idea how this man has, has tolerated me for like, we've been together like 20 years, I think. It'll be 20 years married. Um, but he just kind of listens and sometimes i don't want someone to fix it sometimes i just want to cry and say this is awful this is the worst day of my life and uh he wants to fix everything and he gets in a panic and he doesn't want to see me suffer but he knows that this is a tough i mean this is tough on him me doing this and um you know, I don't think people talk about that a lot. Um, Brian Keene is a huge <laughs> mentor of mine. I absolutely love Brian Keene. And um, Brian, gosh, I, you know, we were talking recently and he said something to the effect, he's like, this is really hard on the spouses. Be, be, be kind to Gerardo because you're just, you know, stressed out all the time. And he's seeing you stressed out and he can't fix it so you know recognize that and it was like the first time where i was like wow i am neglecting that this is stressful for him because he sees me you know up late at night sleeping four hours a night when i have a crazy deadline um into the forest was not an easy project to write it was very um uh mentally taxing um but he he's just become my go-to to um decompress and talk to and i mean he's kind of like my go-to for everything um other people that i've talked to quite a bit brian brian Keane, who's i mean i i can't thank him enough for his time and his support gabino iglesias i like that's like my brother from another mother i absolutely love gabino <laughs> And, um, you know, it's, Gabino has seen, you know, he has had, you know, all, all, every writer has had their struggles and, and whatnot, but, you know, he sees that my struggles are a little bit different because I'm a woman, a Latina, and so he recognizes that, and so he's been really supportive. Um, so I've, I've been thankful for those two <laughs> tremendously, and there have been others, um, that have just kind of reached out and I, and I'm always, 
sometimes I feel alone here, but there have been, it's been shocking to see like, you know, other writers will reach out to me that I'm like, why are you, well, you don't have to reach out, but you did. And that was so kind. And I guess established writers get it. They get that this is stressful and sometimes it feels thankless. And many of them have taken time out of their day to talk to me and just say, hey, at the end of the day, what matters is the work. Um, take some time, but you have to take some time for yourself and take care of yourself too. Um, you know, I, I haven't mentioned yet, but on top of all of my entire wildlife, I also have two special needs children. Um, and I'm in a PhD that I am slowly trying to finish. So um, I do a lot. <laughs> and, my, and it probably goes back to having to have my every single corner of my brain power occupied with something so that I don't get sad and I don't get stuck in like some negative thought loop. Um, and maybe that doesn't work for other people. And I don't think it should work for other people. No, I don't think people should work at this pace because it's not normal. But for me, it's been helpful to kind of always be busy and always be working because I notice when I'm not working, I get really sad. <laughs> Um, about anything really. So I, I think I'm just prone to being sad about things and I try not to think about the past at all. But I've, I've said before, like I wake up and it is work to be kind to myself. It is work to tell myself, don't, don't read review. I don't, I don't review, read reviews anymore. I've stopped. I don't, I haven't looked at reviews like in months and months, but it's, it's work to sit at my computer and not hear every single awful thing launched at me and or about my work criticisms or whatnot I just have to be good to myself and I have to just work at being focused on um, the fact at least for me and my belief that there isn't a lot of time I don't believe there's a lot of time I believe I have um, a set amount of time on this planet to do whatever I want to do and so when I get up in the morning, I have to tell myself, what is it that you need to accomplish today? Because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And I've seen that. I've seen that with beautiful young people that had every possibility before them and have that taken away. And so maybe in some strange way, it's my rush and my madness to just work and do things so I could leave something behind. Um, and it's work to, to do that to be okay, to say that it's gonna, it's gonna be okay, I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna get something done, I'm gonna create something, and hopefully it means something to someone. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's important that we should never take tomorrow for granted. We should never really take anything for granted because we don't know when there's not going to be a tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, sometimes I wonder like, you know, what would my, my outlook on life be if I, you know, haven't gone through and seen everything I've seen. And so would I work so hard, would I be so, would I, you know, constantly be in the state of, I have to hustle, I have to create, I have to work. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> this is, this is, I, this is how I work and I don't see it stopping. Um, but I think, you know, at least uh, another aspect of joy has been my children have mm. made me um, a little more um, happy. <laughs> like I, I, they, they have brought like tremendous joy to me and just like creativity. And I feel like I, I feel like I'm a different writer today because of them. Um, and I see like the. I see like the possibility and the whimsy and the, the joy and like the smallest things. And I, I feel like I needed that desperately. And then they have given that to me and I feel like they've made me, um, they've, they've given me a gift because I was, I mean, I was not in a good place for a very long time. Um, for a long time, I was not in a good place and having them, I think it's, it's, they've given me, I think the healing that I, that I needed. Mm. Yeah. And what is it that you're doing for self care 
And I mean, how often do you take non-work time for you? I'm trying to be better about that. <laughs> um, I I meditate a lot. I try to meditate. I meditate every day. Um, I like to spend time outside. Um, so I I do little rituals where, like, you know, my my getting my morning coffee. Now that now that things are a little, you know, I can go out with the mask into a coffee shop. I try to go in the mornings and get a coffee and maybe sit outside. I try to just be alone with my thoughts. Um, journaling has been helpful for me. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a gift and a curse I've said about social media because it's because, because of social media, I've been able to grow a platform and I've been able to, um, meet people and have an audience. But it's also, there is also like a level of anxiety and stress that comes along with social media. So I try to take breaks from it when I see that, you know, I, I don't think, um, I think that, um, it's, a, it's like I said, it's been an important tool for me to grow my platform and my um, community. And I didn't have that before. And I'm thankful because I've been able to do that, but uh, stepping away from social media has been helpful. So, and forcing myself to um, not always be working. And I think there's also something to, um, even if you're not actually writing, if you're thinking about what it is you're gonna write, that's also part of creating. Um, I, I, have a, I have an office now, which I'm very excited about. Um, so I had an office created in the in a back part of my house, and I spend a lot of time here. And sometimes I'll just probably most of the day I'm I'm in here. Um, but even just kind of like thinking about the characters or the poetry I want to write, um, that's I feel like also very helpful for me. Just the process of thinking. Um, so I don't know uh, if that helps, but yeah, self-care is a very important thing for me. I mean, journaling, meditating, uh, saying good things to myself. I've been, mm-hmm. I've been very like, like a huge <laughs> um, advocate of telling people and other writers to say good things about yourself. Like if you look like a crazy person, so go to the bathroom or go to the quiet place, but like, Say a nice thing about yourself. I, I grew up in an environment where nice things weren't said to me. My parents didn't really tell me I love you. My parents didn't, my parents called, you know, they weren't, they, uh, uh, they had issues with communicating. Um, and so I grew up in a, environment where I wasn't told I was smart. I wasn't told I was creative. I wasn't told I was pretty. I wasn't told any good things. And so it's been a lot of like deprogramming myself (laughs) to tell myself, you're good. You're smart. You're creative. Hey, this story you're working on, it's, it's good. Like you're, you're doing a good job. You know, something as simple as telling yourself that it kind of changes your mood. It changes your day. Um, I think that's important. And that's one of, one of the reasons why I feel like people should be very careful with social media because it can get, um, can get really negative and and just draining. Mm -hmm. And if there's something that you're doing that you feel like you come away from that activity and you don't feel good after you come away from that activity, then don't do it. Or if, if you if, if you can you know not like your day job like pull away as much as you can so it's very like for example social media um if you notice that you're going on there and every time you go on there you come off and you feel awful and then you can't write maybe don't go on social media or maybe put a timer and just use it for like an update like hey today i'm going to be on this podcast or today i'm going to be doing this because you still want to be if you still want to be part of that you know uh, discussion um so being kind to yourself i think is part of self-care you're you're in your head all day every day and as writers and creators we want to be as humans we want to be told that we're good we want to be told that we're we're of value 
And so it's very important that you yourself think that you're valuable, you're important. And sometimes, you know, telling yourself that in the morning will change your day. Yeah, and I think with regards to social media, I mean, sometimes you hear people talking about these are the rules, these are the things to do to grow your platform, these are the things not to do. But the truth is, we don't have to do anything we don't want to do. We don't have to engage with anyone we don't want to engage with. And because somebody, you know, tweets you or whatever, you don't have to reply to anything. We don't have to do anything we don't want. And, you know, the sooner we realize that, the more liberating it can be. You know, we create, we decide how we use our own platform because it's our platform. It's like our kind of space. And we wouldn't allow a person to just waltz into our living room and demand something of us. And so we shouldn't do that on social media either. Exactly. Like your, your time, your creativity is so valuable. You don't owe anyone your time. You don't owe anyone any aspect of your energy. I mean, it's, you, you just don't. And there's no rules in terms of like who you have to respond to or what you have to do. I mean, we're all kind of figuring this out. Do what feels good to you and do what is positive for you and for your, you know, your work um, and for just like your, you know, your mental health. I feel like social media can be so draining. Um, and again, and like you said, you don't owe anyone any of your time. You don't owe anyone any of your energy. You don't have to respond to anybody. You don't have to engage with anybody that does not, that you don't want to. And it's very true. I mean, you spoke about your upbringing and your parents' issues with communication. I'm wondering, how has this impacted your own parenting? Oh, wow. I I remember after I had my first son, the <laughs> one of the rules at the hospital when I had my first son was my mother is not allowed. <laughs> anywhere near the delivery room um i did not want that woman anywhere near me while i was in in labor um i remember looking at my son and and telling him i am not going to be anything like my mother was um i constantly tell this child i love you you're a hard worker you're important I mean, I have him repeat these things at night. Like that's part of our bedtime routine. When I get him into bed, you know, we go through and I have him say, you know, I worked hard today. I am creative. I am loved. That's so important. Um, It was, it was a really sad upbringing for me. Um, And, you know, I think again, it's my parents, had a very difficult upbringing. They were raised in rural Puerto Rico in the 1940s. Um, My father left home when he was 16. My mother had all sorts of issues at her house where she was not allowed to leave until she was like 21 or something. And even then when she left her house, she had to live with her brother. She was on, you know, it's um, very, very strict. Uh, upbringing for my mother and sometimes I feel sorry for her because I don't I think that um, she was made to be that way and um, I know I know they love me in their way and we've had many issues uh, that we're still working through my parents are in their 70s um, and uh, I I just want to make sure that my children know that I love them. My children know that they're important to me. I want my children to know that I think great things about them and I'm never going to raise my voice to them. I'm never going to make them scared. Um, You know, I, uh, it it was tough. My upbringing was very tough with my parents. And um, sometimes I wish it, I, I wish it wasn't. And it's part of recognizing what my past was like and knowing that I was able to be okay after growing up in a place where I feel like I 
probably should have been loved better, but um, I am changing that with my children. Thank you so much for listening to part one of the conversation with Cynthia Paleo. Join us again next time for the second and final part. But if you want to get that ahead of the crowd, if you want to get every episode ahead of the crowd, become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. As a patron, you can submit questions to each and every guest, including the likes of Alex E. Harrow and Richard Godry. And of course, you'll also be getting patrons only episodes such as Story Unboxed, the horror podcast on the craft of writing and the patrons only Q&A sessions. So head over to patreon.com forward slash this is horror and see if it's a good fit for you. All right, before we wrap up, a little bit of an advert break. Winner of the Indies Today 2020 Best Horror Award, Michael Jess Alexander's Boarded Windows Dead Leaves is a tour de force horror collection of tales meant to terrify. Alexander's writing adds a twist of wryness to the reader's smugly satisfied smile, says reader's favorite. Fire Fiction says, you'll feel at home with these stories, which certainly offer an entertaining and macabre read. Pick up Boarded Windows Dead Leaves on Amazon and other retailers, also now available as an incredible audiobook experience courtesy of Spooky House Press. Spacefaring researchers disturb an ancient horror. An enchanted object curses a grieving widow. A haunted reel torments a film student. A murder trial hinges on a chilling testimony. Howls from Hell. A new horror anthology from Hal Society Press. Stephen Graham Jones calls it quality horror by true believers who can write. With a foreword by Grady Hendrix, Howls from Hell unveils the horror writers of tomorrow with spine-tingling stories from P.L. McMillan, Shane Hawk, J.W. Donnelly, Lindsay Ragsdale, Amanda Nevada DeMille, and others. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audiobook from Amazon and most other major booksellers. Howls from Hell. All right, well, we normally have a quote or some final thoughts at this point but actually we have timed this episode with Cynthia Paleo's birthday so happy birthday to Cynthia and we want you to all wish her a happy birthday as well and the best way to do that or the way that I'm going to encourage you to do that is to head over to Twitter like, I don't know if she's going to appreciate this, Bob, because I'm going to suggest that people tag Cynthia at Cena Paleo and wish her a happy birthday. It's September the 9th. That is her birthday. If it's September the 10th, you know, say happy belated birthday. If you're listening to this in November, November 12th, maybe, say, oh. Just wanted to wish you a happy birthday for September the 9th. I know it's a couple of months late. So just whenever you hear this episode, wish you a happy birthday. If you hear it in September 2022 and it's not the 9th yet, you could wish you an early birthday. So, you know, make her feel loved, make her feel appreciated. Head over to her Twitter, at Cena Paleo. And wish her a happy birthday. What do you reckon, Bob? Is she going to appreciate that or think, fucking hell, Michael, you just flooded (laughs) my Twitter with all these fucking Uh, messages saying happy birthday. I think think she will appreciate it. I really do. Um, Okay. So, um, and definitely, you know, I I like it when people remember my birthday. And it's, you know, and... As as we get older, like me, I, I don't. I'm just. I feel like I'm lucky to have another birthday. Um, but it, it's a uh, it's a good feeling. I, I like that. It's and I always try to make a point to tell people happy birthday. So yeah, let's. We're definitely going to wish her a happy birthday. Okay, so September the 9th, Cena Paleo, happy birthday. But next year, June eighteenth. 
I want you all to head on over to at Bob Pastorella because you got to wish him a happy birthday as well. This is yeah, now apparently gonna... the birthday segment of this is horror. Yeah, I'm going to wish me a happy birthday too. There you go. We'll see you in the next episode of This Is Horror for part two of Cynthia Paleo. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.